as far now as the history moving forward from this point, we have groups that uh, became Gnostics. We have a Johannite community that exists probably well into the third or fourth century. Uh, they wrote the Secret Book of John, which is a Gnostic favorite, um, which is considered a Sethian text. But um, well, they, I'm sorry, they probably didn't write the Secret Book of John. They probably appropriated the Secret Book of John, which would be a, a more accurate um, description. The Secret Book of John has these kind of bookend pieces and little inserts. Uh, and if you can, it, they're very easy to spot when you're reading the book. Um, it would book, it's a short little thing. Uh, and if you pull out the parts that are overtly Christian, you have what ends up being a fairly standard, um, well, standard, a, a Jewish neoplatonic kind of mashup uh, Gnostic Judaism essentially um, which is a, a very interesting kind of dynamic and, and you see that um, you see that kind of thing in the works of the Essenes not exactly the same thing but you see where there's a little bit of overlap from the different concepts of the Essene community and what would become the Gnostics the Dead Sea Scrolls and all of that so uh, you have where was I going with that? Oh, okay. <coughs> so you have the groups. So the, the, the Johannite community after the split grabs that bit of document, tacks on some Christian-y bits, calls it the secret book of John, because in the Christian-y bits it's a story of Jesus talking to the disciple John after Jesus uh, returns to earth after his death. Um, I think the canonical... Uh, account of the, the the return of Jesus after his death is uh, 40 days, right? Jesus comes back for 40 days in the canonical version, but we have him coming back anywhere from 40 days to like 10 years. Yeah, it's it's flexible. <laughs> maybe he showed up a lot. Maybe, you know, maybe he showed up to the Native Americans in America. Who knows? Um, but so we have um, so we have them writing that document. We have the. Gnostic ideas being developed, percolated through the various traditions that are happening in the Middle East at this time. And then there's a bit of a fuzziness that we're not entirely sure who goes where and what happens. But what we can do is we can kind of trace a lot of the ideas. We can't trace individual groups or individual people. It was a long time ago. But what we can talk about is Gnostic concepts showing up at different places throughout history. So I'm not going to say that this is how Gnosticism came to the modern age, but I'm saying that this is where Gnostic ideas were popping up from then until now. So you, talk, you have some ideas that are arguably Gnostic popping up with the Paulicians that would eventually become the Bogomils. I mean, these kinds of things are actually known. So the Paulicians become the Bogomils, who become the Cathars. In a, I mean, over a long period of time, it, it, there isn't exactly a one-to-one -one relationship. I mean, you can't point to an apostolic succession of for, for the Cathars. Um, yeah, the Bogomils to the Cathars. From the Bogomils to the Cathars. The Paulicians is a little bit of a um, an intuitive leap. But, uh, but anyway, so the Cathars, as you probably know, <coughs> were a group in, uh, in southern France, um, and they were uh, the focus of the, uh, the only, I think, the only crusade against a Christian group of, of the whole um, crusade slash inquisition period. Uh, they, were, they were certainly um, persecuted. They, they, were, they were hunted down. Well, they weren't really hunted down because they weren't really running, but um, the, you, you hear about the... Um, the slaughter at Montsegur in uh, in the south of France, which was the Cathar kind of one of there were certainly a lot of Cathar uh, communities, but this was a big Cathar community. Uh, they were they were put to death. Well, they were going to be put to death, but they uh, no, they didn't escape. They were all they all ended up dead. <laughs> it was unpleasant. The uh, Roman Catholic Church yeah. demonstrated what they really meant by just war doctrine. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's one of those uh, historic factoids that won't everybody knows, which probably you think fabrication. Well, possibly, but you know, it's uh, it, it's still 
I have a hard time wrapping my head around why a Christian group would decide to slaughter another Christian group because they had some funny ideas about some things, but I, I, yeah, it does, it does, but... It has nothing to do with the Northerners trying to go down south and grab all the loot and assets. Yes, and there certainly was a lot of loot and assets to be grabbed. Um, the, the Cathars were, were quite popular in France. I mean, Gnostic, Gnostic ideas in France have always gone you know, really great together. It's like chocolate and peanut butter. The, the, the French just, just love Gnostic ideas. And, and, and all, all of the, well, uh, I would say 99% of all the Gnostic stuff we have today has filtered through France. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> so the Cathars have some Gnostic ideas. They're, you can argue whether or not they were Gnostic, but they were certainly, uh, they certainly had some Gnostic ideas. So, we come to the Cathars. We have the Knights Templar. All right, so this is kind of a big point for us. Uh, our institutional narrative uh, includes a whole story about how when um, Hugh de Payen, the, the guy who founded the Knights Templar in 1118, he traveled to Jerusalem, and he traveled all over the Middle East, and he was going to found a chivalric order, and a, a well, it wasn't a chivalric order at the time. It was a, an order of knights, warrior monks, who were going to protect the pilgrims. So there was nine of them, nine French kind of noblemen, and they went off to the Middle East in order to form the Knights Templar and to protect the pilgrims. This is all historically fact, and you can read about it and all that stuff. Um, they... Uh, uh, they took their, uh, their oath, uh, or they took their rule, rather, from uh, a big shaggy dog. No, wait, St. Bernard. And, uh, and, and he, uh, he, he gave them the authority to be, a, to be a, a, an order, a, a monastic order, but it was a warrior monastic order. They, they actually had uh, armor and swords and rode on horseback and did the whole thing. You, everybody knows who the Knights Templar were. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah, so the guys who invented traveler's checks. They did. They invented traveler's checks. You know, they were the first international bankers and very successful because of it, you know, they, and, uh, and, and they didn't charge very much interest at all. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, it was something that the world had never seen up until that point, but that's neither here nor there. So the, the story goes, the story that we tell about our, our own origins, that the Knights Templar went to the Holy Land, and this guy by the name of Theoclete, uh, which means uh, helper of God. Uh, he go, he, f they, they approach him, or he finds them, or there's some. Somehow they meet up in the Holy Land, and Theoclete is the holder of the secret Joanite tradition. And he sees the Knights Templar, and he says, "These guys are going to do some good work. So I'm going to pass along." the Joanite tradition to these guys. So he lays hands on, he's a bishop uh, in, the, in apostolic succession. He lays his hands on Hugh de Payen and makes Hugh de Payen the grand master of the Knights of the Templar. He makes him a Joanite bishop. So our story goes. Um, there is absolutely zero historical evidence to point to this actually being true, but it's a nice story and we like it. So <laughs> uh, it's, it's, its value is more symbolic than literal. And it could actually be literally true, and uh, but there's just no way of, of, of knowing whether it was actually literally true or not. So the Knights Templar spend proceed to spend, I think, nine years uh, in the Temple Mount of Jerusalem. They, they were called the Poor Knights of the Temple of Christ in Jerusalem, uh, or variations on that name. They had different names. So when they got to the Holy Land, the Christian King of Jerusalem set, that, set them up on the Temple Mount, the, the former site of King Solomon's Temple which was in ruins. The, the nine of them spent nine years there pretty much doing nothing. Or they were protecting pilgrims. Or, you know, they were doing something else. It depends on who you ask. Uh, conspiracy theorists like to say that they found the Holy Grail and, and hung out with Mary Magdalene and things like that. Who knows? Who knows? The, all we really say about that is the Knights Templar existed and they were the holders of the secret lineage of, of the beloved disciple. They were the, the caretakers of the secret church of John, which would become the Joannite church. So the, the grand masters of the temple, as the knights of the temple, went on to pass that lineage down all the way through to Jacques de Molay, who was the final public, quote-unquote, grand master of the Knights Templar. And in 1308, if I have my dates correctly, uh, the king of France and the, the pope uh, of, at the time rounded up a whole bunch of Knights Templar and uh, imprisoned them and took all of their land and their money 
Um, well, took some of their land and their money. <coughs> there were there was a lot of Templar money uh, and property unaccounted for, uh, even to this day. But there was a whole crowd of them that got rounded up, Jacques de Molay among them. And while in prison, Jacques de Molay, according to our tradition, passed on his lineage, his his, his uh, the Grand Mastership of the of the Knights of the Temple, the Joanite Church and uh, Apostolic Succession passed them on to a guy by the name of John Mark Larmanius, who would go on to pass on the lineage and the title, so on and so forth, yada yada yada, down throughout history. Jacques de Millet, of course, was killed. Uh, he was burned at the stake for. Um, originally, he had admitted that he had trampled on the cross and performed all kinds of blasphemy and all of that, and the Pope was going to let him off, but then he felt bad about it and he recanted, and then the Pope ended up burning him at the stake, which has got to be a terrible way to go. Um, and, well, people also, I should point out, people argue that it wasn't strictly the Pope that did it, um, and that the motivations weren't that the Templars were actually committing blasphemy, although undoubtedly many of them probably were in one form or another. They had pretty strict rules about that sort of thing. Um, but the the motivation was m strictly secular. The, uh, the Knights Templar were very wealthy. The King of France was in a whole lot of debt to them. So the King of France says, yeah, we're going to accuse them of heresy, and then I get to keep all their stuff. Um, so that certainly was true, and that certainly happened. But, um, you know, whether, whether or not they were secret Gnostics who were protecting the secret church of John, or whether or not they were just shrewd business bankers who, want, who like to fight against the Muslims, it, 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 you know, we don't know. It's, those records are lost to history. <clears throat> so we have um, the Knights Templars through John Mark Larmanius passing on their lineage again according to our history there's a document called the Larmanius Charter which is a um, I think it's about yay big from the pictures I've seen uh, printed on um, I believe vellum uh, type of animal skin parchment um, which lists all of the Grand Masters from Jacques de Molay, the last public Grand Master of the Temple, down through this guy named Bernard Raymond Fabre Pelleprat, who was a doctor in France in the early or late 1700s, early 1800s. <coughs> now, Bernard Raymond Fabre Pelleprat, or BRFP as we like to call him, he is a doctor. He's Napoleon's one of Napoleon's private doctors. Uh, he is one of the very first people to um, experiment with electricity for medical purposes. Um, it, they called it galvanization or galvan something. Galvan, I don't know. I don't speak French. But um, kind of an interesting, and, and a lot of uh, medical textbooks will talk, even to this day, medical historical textbooks will talk about his work, um, his early work with, with electricity and um, zapping people for fun and profit. And so, uh, he was a Freemason, uh, as a lot of the kind of wealthier gentlemen in, in France were at the time. And he was, according to his records and the people around him, he is the, at the time, in the, in the early 1800s, the current holder of the lineage of the beloved disciple. He is the current Grand Master of the Knights of the Temple. And uh, he is the, uh, I mean, well, he, he isn't calling himself a bishop at this point. <coughs> but he is calling himself the Grand Master of the Knights of the Temple. So in 1804, <coughs> he publicly re-emerges or recreates, who knows, the, the Knights Templar. So this is, a at this point, a Roman Catholic institution, uh, much like it was back in the days of the Crusades when the original Knights Templar... Sorry, what was the date? 1804. 1804? 04, yes. And so he comes out with the, the Knights Templar. They have a rule. They have some documents. They have the Larmanius Charter, which has all the Grand Masters listed on it, all the way up through Bernard Raymond Fabre Pelleprat. And, uh, and they have a whole bunch of, of folks. I can't tell you whether or not there was a Knights Templar from Jacques de Molay to Bernard Raymond Fabre Pelleprat. All we can really say for sure is there was a Knights Templar before that, and there was a Knights Templar after that. All of the Templar lineages that exist today, and there are 
uh, a fair number of them, all trace their lineage back to Bernard Raymond Fabry Pellet Pratt and through the Larminius Charter. As far as I know, I'd email me if, if I'm wrong. <coughs> um, so, Fabry Pellet Pratt uh, goes along for a decade with his Knights Templar. Um, things are going great. He's, you know, doing well with his doctrine. He's doing well with the Knights Templar and the Freemasonry, and things are going fine. He discovers, discovers, a, uh, as you can see, I'm a little skeptical about the actual factual history of all of this, but it's a, it's, it's a good story regardless. Uh, he discovers a document in a bookstall um, uh, that is called um, the Leviticon slash Evangelicon. And uh, there's a copy of volume one of it for sale right here. <laughs> and you can you can buy that. Uh, give me your money, and I'll hand you a book. Okay. Um, so the Leviticon slash Evangelicon is a collection of documents. Uh, this particular volume contains an alternative translation of the fourth gospel. Uh, it isn't remarkably different. The the kind of important differences are um, it does not contain the last two chapters, which is the post resurrection stuff, the post um, the post death stuff that happens in the canonical Bible in the last two chapters of, of John. There are other smaller additions, subtractions, very few additions, but mostly subtractions from what you would traditionally know as the fourth gospel. It's a very interesting... I've done a lot of work actually comparing this the Leviticon with the canonical Bible and to see exactly what the differences are. And, you know, because I'm, I'm a geek like that and I enjoy... Uh, Joe and I stuff. <coughs> the the interesting thing to me is a lot of the parts that are that are added for explan explanation, explanatory stuff. And again, not all, but a lot of it is is not in that version. So, assuming for a second that you have a document that would have been written by the Jewish Johannine community, you know, or the very recently Jewish Johannine community before. Gentiles started coming into the group. They would have used terms like rabbi and, and all the other, uh, you know, Jewish stuff that was getting kind of parenthetical explanations in later versions of the document. It's possible, again, we have no way of knowing for sure, it's possible that this represents a version that comes from that period before they started adding the parentheses for the Greeks. That's, that's one way of looking at it. And of course, it's it has a lot of kind of Gnostic significance because after Jesus dies, you know, that's pretty much it. What happens is the, the, the group that would have had a document like this would go on to write the secret book of John, which is book two of the Gospel of John, a lot of people want to say. So, Bernard Raymond Fabry Pelleprat, it's 1814, finds this document, conveniently, in a bookstall, and it contains, which happens a fair bit. I have a theory that's, that there is a mystical, supernatural bookstall that kind of travels along, and every now and then it'll show up and somebody will find a mystical, esoteric document, and like, oh! Have you ever named Pantar? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> At any rate, so it contains the version of the Gospel of John. It also contains some um, commentary on the Gospel of John, uh, which that part of it will be published in English, uh, you know, within a year, I think. But I'm not, you know, don't hold me to it. Maybe six months. Um, and uh, several other documents relating to the the secret church of John. So Fabry Palaprat says, "Oh, hey, I got this Templar thing." I got this Joanite thing. Let's mash them together. So he makes the official religion of the Knights Templar Johannite Gnosticism. He doesn't call it that. He calls it the Church of Christ. Officially, he calls it the Church of Christ. Um, it, it is known in a lot of historical documents as the Joanite Church of Primitive Christians, which is more of a descriptor than an actual title, although a lot of people will think that is the actual title of the church. But Palaprat always called it the Church of Christ. So he makes this the official religion of the Templars. An awful lot of the existing Templars, because there were quite a few of them at this point, you know, 10 years after the coming out party of the, uh, the Templars in 1804, 
they had been they had done a fair bit of recruiting. I mean, who doesn't want to be a Knight Templar? So he, as the Grand Master, says, "Okay, hey, guess what, guys? We're all Gnostic now." A lot of a lot of that didn't sit very well <laughs> with a lot of the guys. Um, and then, and shortly after his death, the Knights nice Templar says, "Okay, guys, can we go back to Rome now?" And they did, and they went back to to the Roman Catholic Church, not before Palaprat had really kind of fleshed out what his Church of Christ was, ordained a bunch of bishops and priests, and they were off doing their thing. So, what happened then between Palaprat and 2000 is also a bit in the murky territory. Um, we can trace the lineage from Palaprat through bishop, 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 bishop to our bishop, but we don't know a lot about, you know, what we have is a list of names. We don't really know a lot about what happened after the Knights Temple, after Palaprat's death and after the Knights Templar went back to being Roman Catholic. Um, again, it's part of our traditional history. The current Joanite Church, I should point out, is not Palaprat's Church, because Palaprat's Church functionally ceased to exist as a self-organized body. Um, but the way that apostolic succession and lineage works, you can trace, you know, there's still a Joanite Church that exists, even if it's just one person, and they can pass that on down the line. We don't, we don't make a claim to be the only Joanite church or the only church that has the Joanite lineage, the Fabry Palaprat lineage, because all of the Gnostic churches have it. You know, they, it was spread fairly far and wide. Um, we don't claim to have the authority of Palaprat's church. Um, as far as I know, nobody really does. Um, some people might, but they have probably shaky claim on that uh, anyway, but that's not important. So, the modern Joe and I church. Anybody have any questions about the history before we go and do what we're doing today? All right. The modern Joe and I church was formed in 2000 by a guy by the name of James Foster, Bishop James Foster, uh, who went by the uh, ecclesiastical title of Johannes the <clears> Third, <throat> and he took Johannes the Third um, as a, a, an homage to John the Baptist, which I who I didn't talk about. I probably should have mentioned John the Baptist, John the Disciple, and then all the way through to him. He, he was number three. He formed the Apostolic Joanite Church as a, as a reaction to, well, he saw that there was a need. He saw that there was a need for this particular type of Christian Gnosticism and, and uh, put together what we have as the church today. He did not stay as patriarch for very long. Uh, he ordained a couple of folks, uh, including the current patriarch, and then uh, advanced the current patriarch to the episcopacy to, to be a bishop, and then kind of went off, and he is a, uh, a practicing Buddhist now um, in, uh, in Ohio. And he's, you know, a lot of Gnostics become Buddhists. It's a kind of, it, it, there's, a, <laughs> there's an off-ramp on Gnosticism, and it goes to Buddhism. And, and it, so that, that, happens, that happens quite a bit. Um, the current patriarch uh, is Johannes IV, because he's the next guy, and presumably the next patriarch will be Johannes V. <laughs> Although, let's hope that's a long time from now, because he's going to watch the video. <laughs> Hi, Sean. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, the church today uh, operates in one, two, three, four, five countries officially, uh, with several more coming on board as we, as we uh, progress. There are, most of the, the parishes are in uh, North America. We have um, a bishop in Spain who is uh, a, a Knight Templar as well, and he does some other things. He's, he's not really focusing on churchy stuff at the moment. He's more focusing on Templar stuff at the moment, which is all right because it's hard to communicate with him. He only speaks Spanish anyway. Um, <laughs> and we don't have a lot of Spanish speakers. It, it's, a, it's a problem. But um, and then Australia, New Zealand. There's a there's a whole handful of, of new groups popping up in Australia, and New Zealand. We've got some really some really motivated people down that way, who are uh, who are doing some great work. So uh, the Joanite Church today, and I I read to you from some of the statement of principles. In fact, uh, well, I didn't read all of them, but you can see them all on on Joanite.org. Our statement of principles, and if, and essentially what that means is our are not these nine statements are what makes us us and there's a lot of room for interpretation amongst that you know we have 
uh, we have priests who don't consider themselves to be Christian. Um, we have priests that are, you know, would consider themselves to be more pagan. Um, we've got a lot of, you know, Buddhists who, who hang out with us. And it's all good. You know, it, it's not... It's not anything goes, you know. There's there's certainly a lot of beliefs that wouldn't fit in with the statement of principles, but you know, yeah, yeah. What, our church, like a lot of the modern Gnostic churches, in fact, probably most of the modern Gnostic churches, we don't have any membership requirements. You know, if you want to come and hang out, if you want to come to the Eucharist, if you want to receive the Eucharist when we do it, that's all cool. Um, we don't think that it's that important. We do have membership processes like like most Gnostic churches do um, if people want to commit and be you know officially part of our family but but again people you know we have people in, in our parishes who have been coming forever who don't want to be members and that's perfectly fine yes I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about the relationship between the Bob and the Logos and the uh, that's a very long topic, and I think it's worth its own thing. But yeah, uh, maybe we should put that into the schedule. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, there has that's been the question for the for the viewers at home is the uh, can I explain the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Um, it took about a thousand years for mainstream Christianity to work that all out. Uh, through several uh, ecumenical councils and, and things, and what what the Joannite Church tends to come down on is is pretty standard um, canonical biblical you know orthodox whatever you want to call it lines. Um, the the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one substance that expresses itself as three persons. And depending again on on which role it's playing at any given time, it's one of those things that's kind of a mystery, and you know, it, it's something that we're not necessarily going to say this is how it is because nobody knows how God is. You know, we have a framework that we use to talk about God, and that's pretty much the best we can do. And the rest of it is up to your own. I know it's a cop-out answer, <laughs> but it's Gnosticism. There's a lot of that. <laughs> so, um, but it's a, it's a good topic. That we don't call it cop-out answers. We call it apophatic theology. Apophatic theology. What we can't say about God is much more important than what we can. Apophatic or apophatic? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's that would be a great topic to do a whole a whole lecture on. So I think we will cover that quite soon. What I want to talk about before we wrap up here is there's um, our patriarch, our current patriarch, Ioannis IV, he put together what I think is just a beautiful description of the beloved disciple as a model for our own kind of discipleship, how we can live our lives and be truly Joanite. Um, and to, to